This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? See you, Brad? It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. It's finally November, and it's feeling like hockey season outside. The Flames won their first two games of the of the month, and as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're back to talk Flames hockey. How you doing, Matt? Good. Uh, it's an interesting week where the Flames have won, are now on a three-game winning streak, and they beat three of the best teams in the Eastern Conference, the Washington Capitals last week, and both the Pittsburgh Penguins and New Jersey Devils this week. Well, let's talk a little bit about the games that were this week. Um, we talked a little bit about Washington last show. Anything else you want to add, or should we just move no, on no, to no. the next just two? Just more of that, hey, we beat three of the best in the East. Well, the Calgary Flames on November 2nd had the Pittsburgh Penguins, one of the powerhouse teams in the league, coming into town, and I wasn't really sure what to expect in this one. I was kind of expecting the Flames to get blown out. But it was a surprising end to this. As usual, Mike Smith kept the Flames in. Smith turned away 43 shots, and Gio tallied the overtime game winner to propel the Flames past the Penguins at home, 2-1. to one. Overall thoughts on this one, Matt? Well, the Flames had a few days off between the Capitals game and the Penguins game, and they came out extremely flat to start the game, and... If it wasn't for Mike Smith... They got but, outplayed bad in the first. Oh, yeah. Uh, that was terrible, <laughs> the first period. But after that point, once they got their legs going, the Flames were by far the better team and carried the way until overtime. And Kachuk stealing the puck off uh, si- that so-so player, Sidney Crosby, to set up Giordano for the winner, it, all good. You know, this is this was an interesting game to me because last year we would see that when the Flames would get down in a game early, even if not down on the scoreboard, but getting kind of their butts handed to them, they would just pack up shop and stop playing. And I think this was a great test of their resiliency that they came back in the second. I thought they got the better scoring chances in the second period, and that's really when they were able to um, move the game in their favor. Yeah, now the Flames are on a five-game winning streak against the Penguins, which is bizarre, considering that they've won the Cup twice in a row. But, uh, no, the Flames, they're slowly, slowly starting to play like we expected them to be at the beginning of the year, and where they're doing all the little things correctly, it's just... It's still a work in progress. And credit on the Penn side, obviously, to to their goaltender, their, I guess, third string goal. No, second, their backup goal. I keep thinking Flurry's there, but uh, Jari was in net, and he, he, I think he plays well for a guy with limited NHL experience. Well, both the backups that the Flames faced this week, uh, as well as uh, Kincaid for New Jersey, they both played very well, and... They kept their teams in it, and if it wasn't for their stellar performances, they would have. The Flames wouldn't have needed overtime to deal with either team. Well, let's talk about that next game, the New Jersey game. On uh, it was a Sunday game, not a Sunday matinee for once, which is kind of weird. But Sean Monahan, Michael Froelich, and Michael Furlan tallied a goal and an assist as the Flames beat the Devils for their third consecutive win. This was a five to four win in a shootout. And I thought this, as a hockey fan, I thought this was an entertaining game. As a Flames fan, I wasn't happy the Flames let go of it in the second period. The goals that New Jersey scored were mostly oddball weird goals. Like it, Normally, the defender clears the puck on the two rebound-style goals, and the other two were just kind of odd shots that snuck in. So, yeah, you it, that was probably Mike Smith's worst game as a Flame, but if that's, you know, a bad game for him, that's fine. And thankfully for Calgary, the secondary scoring actually kicked in for probably the first time this season with Froelich 
and Stone getting goals. Well, we should mention Stone was also playing more minutes than usual. Uh, Travis Hamanick is out injured, so Stone jumped back into the top four playing with TJ Brody once again. Yeah. Now, here's a question for you. Was, and I thought Stone was probably the best-looking flame on the ice. Yeah, that was what I was going to ask you, is with how well Stone played with Brody last year and in this game, do you consider putting Hamanick with Kulak when he's ready to go? I think you have to base this on more than one game with Brody. But yeah, if we keep saying, seeing the same production, let's assume Hamannick's out for a week and we keep seeing the same production for the next week. I definitely think that um, I would at least start Hamannick back with Kulak. If nothing else, it gives him less minutes to get his legs back on him after an injury. But yeah, I think that it would definitely be something I'd look at and make Hamannick earn his way back into the top four minutes. Well, one thing I I don't think I want to f- I don't think at this point I want to break up um, Hamilton and Joe. No. One thing I've noticed, especially in this game, is that the Flames defenders were shooting the puck significantly more. Like I think Stone had five shots himself, and that's one of the reasons why the Flames have struggled with the secondary scoring, especially lower with the lower lines, is that none of the defensemen are jumping into the play much. Or shooting the pucks, and it's tough to get offense if the defenders aren't contributing at all. And that's how the Flames have generated offense over the last couple seasons. So seeing that those guys are chipping in with some shots and trying to get things on net will help everybody else because rebounds are there and whatever, tips, deflections, you name it for all the other forwards. Yeah, I'm just looking at the stats here. Every Flames defenseman had at least one shot on goal. Giordano had one. Brody had one. Stone had six. Hamilton had four. Uh, Bartkowski had one. Mm -hmm. And Kulak had one. So, yeah, I think you're right. The more we can get those pucks, and even, I mean, I think we have to be realistic that not every puck from the blue line is going to go in, but if nothing else, it keeps the puck in the offensive zone and gives the forwards more time to play that puck and try to make something happen. You know, the other interesting thing about the New Jersey Devils is this is a really interesting team, the way they're putting it together. I mean, there's a team that was dead last last year, and we now have Taylor Hall and Nico Heischer and Drew Stafford, and it's sort of a team that looks like they've got some pieces in place, and it was kind of weird to watch the team play because they still look like a bottom team, but you can see some pieces that I think in two, three years, the Devils could be a very interesting team to watch. Yeah, and the the key with the Devils' season is how their young rookies continue to perform because Will Butcher and Jesper Bratt both kind of came out of nowhere, and even Gibbons, uh, frankly, at the start of the season came out of nowhere to be key contributors. And if they fade at all, uh, the Devils are just going to sink like a rock in the standings, but... If they can keep it up, then they could make the playoffs this year. It's one of those things you just never know. Yeah, I don't know if they're that good. I'm not sure they're playoff caliber yet, but I definitely think that they've got some pieces. I think Taylor Hall's looking more comfortable there, and I think they have some pieces that will make them more competitive in two, three years. Matt, uh, the big stories this week for the Flames was their waiver moves. The Flames made two waiver moves for forwards this week. Um, first, Freddie Hamilton placed on waivers. We thought that meant the return of Yarmer Yager. And we didn't see Yager come back. We saw the lineup stay the way it was. And then today, Tanner Glass put on waivers. And again, we're thinking the impending return of Yager. Any thoughts on these? Any thoughts on are we going to see both guys go to the AHL? Is this just a move for flexibility? What do you think the Flames are thinking? Well, with those two moves, I think that they're clearing out the spare forward spots on the team so that way they can assign other players to the like 13th and 14th forward roles. And I think that you'll see Curtis Lazar and Matt Sajan removed from the lineup uh, once everybody's healthy and potentially a, a, another recall... Um, replacing uh, one of those two players with a guy that's performing really well in Stockton, which is Andrew Mangiapane, who has 16 points already this season. Uh, 
a lot of people thought Tanner Glass would make the lineup as it was. He was kind of brought in as the muscle guy and hasn't played. But especially looking at how Hathaway's playing, I think if you want that muscle guy, Glass is definitely the guy to do it. And I also think it's interesting what this will mean to the AHL team if Glass gets sent down, because now you've got Gadzik and Glass, and that's going to be a tough line to play against if they're both on the ice at the same time. Oh, for sure. And the New York Rangers, when Tanner Glass was there, he played primarily in the AHL until the playoffs. So it's not like you need to carry Glass all season. If there's a need for him down the line, you can always recall him and stick him in the lineup and he'll be fine. And then the other roster move that happened is with Travis Hamanek getting injured and putting on the IR. It means Rasmus Anderson has been called up to the Flames. He didn't play against New Jersey, which is why Bartkowski was in the lineup. I don't think he was in town yet, but I don't anticipate seeing Bartkowski for the rest of the week against Vancouver, Detroit, or St. Louis. I think you call Rasmus up to play him. Would you agree? Yeah, and especially with Bartkowski's defensive error that caused a penalty shot that if Smith didn't poke check Wood, I think uh, the Flames would have ended up losing that game, which would have been directly because of Barkowski. So I think that Anderson will get in the lineup and go from there. So at this point, if we kind of look at the way that I think the lineup's shaking down, Jankowski is going to replace Tanner Glass on the full-time Flames roster. Anderson is going to replace Hamannick. At least for now, Yager's going to be back soon, who will probably replace, um, I don't know, Freddie Hamilton. But Yager already had a spot on the team, so he's not really taking Hamilton's spot. So I guess the question is, where does that leave Freddie Hamilton? Does he go to the AHL? Does he stay in the NHL? Is this just a move so they have flexibility? What do you think happens with Freddie? Well, I think both Freddie and Tanner Glass are likely destined for Stockton. It the Flames have 30 days to figure out what they want to do now that they clear. So, 30 days or 10 games. Yeah, so we'll see. I I would expect Hamilton to go down. Like, if Yager is ready for the Vancouver game, you'll see Hamilton go down. and We'll see from there. So you were saying earlier you think that Stajan and Lazar are going to be sat. So you think Manjapani would be brought in to play in the bottom six then? Yeah. And where would you slot Manjapani into the lineup? I probably, yeah, I think you'd have to play him. That would be tough because. Like, this is the only thing. Yeah. I think he might come up, but when I look at where do you put him, I'm going to, maybe it's not the right time. Probably on the fourth, yeah, probably on the fourth line with the uh, in Versteeg spot, maybe. I don't See, know. I'm almost thinking that it, it's tough. Like it, he's playing so well in Stockton that like he deserves a, a shot in the NHL because he was the Player of the Month in the AHL, and it's just where do you legitimately stick him? Because like it, uh, the obvious idea would be to stick him with with in Lazar's spot on the line with Jankowski and Bennett, but that's where Yager's going to be, and then. Well, where do you stick Yager? And uh, yeah, it's a little bit of a as mess. much as I think you're right. Manjapani probably deserves a call up. I wonder if he needs it now, or if it could be, you know, what you're playing well. Let's keep playing well, and we'll bring you up later in the season when the time is right. Because I don't want to shove him in there just to shove him in there. The only place I could see maybe putting him is making a fourth line of Versteeg, Manjapani, and Jankowski. But even then, I don't see that being a long-term line. I think it would be kind of Manjapani up for two, three games, give him a shot, and then send him back. Yeah. There's not really any pressing need to do so. It'll be interesting to see, especially with the waivers of the two other players, that what the corresponding roster moves are, because the Flames still have too many forwards at the moment. Well, that's why I'm almost thinking Tanner Glass goes down and we just don't bring somebody up. Like, I think that might be yeah. sort of the move to just free up a roster spot and say, okay, we tried the Tanner Glass thing. It didn't work. Send him down. Janko's made the team essentially in his spot and we just don't bring someone else up. I think, I think this well is be. more of sort of a, I don't want to say catch up, but it's just kind of a make good move. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely think Manjapan would be up here, but at the same time, he's doing so well in the A. I don't want to disturb that by bringing him up for four or five games and then send him back down and he's out of his rhythm. 
I think I agree. right now it's yeah, it's tough because especially with the Flames struggling so much on the bottom six that you'd want to bring somebody who's doing well to see if he can spark those guys. But then you have Yager coming in and he should be able to generate some offense with Bennett and Jankowski. So we'll see. And I'm not convinced that Mangiapane is going to solve any issues in the bottom six. I mean, he looks good in the at the AHL level, but he's playing first-line minutes there. I'm not convinced that bringing him in to play in the NHL is going to help him or help the team. I think it's just a nice perk for the kid for playing well. Mm-hmm. Well, you mentioned some of the bottom six woes, Matt, and a big factor in the Flames, I guess I wouldn't say offensive downfall, but I think it is sort of their downfall is that they're not getting production from their bottom six guys. The third and fourth lines, I think we can say flat out, aren't producing. The only player in the bottom six to have a goal is Chris Versteeg, who has two. Four of the bottom six players don't even have a single point. If we contrast last season at this point, the only player who didn't have a point by November 4th was Freddie Hamilton, and he'd only played in two games, so not really a good result. But at this point, the only six player who didn't have a goal at this point was Lance Boma, and we know what happened to him because of that. So I guess, you know, we've talked in the past about we've had seasons where the bottom six didn't produce and the Flames struggled, and we had seasons where only the bottom six produced and the Flames struggled because the top six weren't. Or well, the top three, I guess, weren't. So what do you do at this point? Do you shuffle the bottom six? Do you think, like you were saying, it's time to bring Manja Pani in? W- what do we do to get the production up from our top six? Because that's going to be what takes the, t- the Flames to the playoffs if they're going to get there. Well, the bottom six, you can start to see that some of the players are playing a little better. And... Like in the last game, the stage in Brower and Versteeg line had several good shifts in a row and were playing well. And they ended up generating a goal that was the stone goal. And it they're coming around. And then the Jankowski line, ever since Janko's been in the NHL, that line has generated about five or six quality scoring chances in each game. It's just they are all snake bitten, Like Sam Bennett getting a breakaway and getting two shots on the breakaway, and he didn't score. And it's... You get the feeling that when these guys have a bounce go their way, like they'll go on a protracted hot streak. Like, I wouldn't be shocked if... Bennett, if he scores like 10 goals in 10 games after he gets his first one, it's just getting that first one. And that's the problem right now that the team's facing is that they're just not getting that from them right now. Yeah, I can see where you're coming from. Um, I think, you know, I've heard a lot of people on Twitter and on various forums saying we need to shake up the bottom six, but I think the best thing we can do at this point with the bottom six is keep some consistency there because I think the more you get to know your guys, the more you get to know your line mates, the better you're going to be. And as you've mentioned, it's just really making sure the bounces are coming. I think it's giving these guys enough time to, you know, get on the ice and get their legs under them and get playing and also to keep the consistency there. And I think with the Yager Furlan switch, that doesn't help things either. Yeah. And once the team like starts getting those bounces, like, yeah, it's, we're approaching the middle of November and like Sam Bennett doesn't have a goal or, you know, stuff like that. But it's, you have to be patient, especially when you have, you're getting enough offense from other places that you can put up with players struggling. And it's not like they're doing anything overtly bad. Like, if you look on, like, towards the advanced statistics, like, most of the players in the bottom six are performing well enough where they're not severely damaging the team. It's just... Getting one of those fluke goals, I think, would help 
it, and it, we're we just haven't been seeing that from the bottom six where you're getting just like a puck bouncing in off a guy or just a garbage goal where everybody crashes the net we haven't seen that yet and it's like it's getting in their head where they want to make the perfect shot or the perfect pass and, instead of just doing what comes natural and they're getting in their own way because of it and that's a good way to put it yeah i think they're getting in their heads i think some of them are trying too hard to get that first goal or that big point and i think that sometimes as an nhl player especially you just need to shut off your brain and just play you're obviously one of the best players out there and just don't think about what you're doing and just play the game and often that's when the best things especially for guys lower in the lineup i find that's often where they do the best is just play your game Hmm. Yeah, and it, even throughout history, that there have been players that like it, I'm going to use a Canadians uh, reference, Guy Lafleur. Uh, Scotty Bowman tried to get him to play defense, and or no, it was uh, Lemaire. Pardon me, that wanted him to play a defensive system, and Lafleur just couldn't do it, and. He, he his production struggled because of that and he just did things his way and he was successful and some players just need to do what comes naturally to them and not try it that hard and especially a guy like sam bennett who has all the talent in the world like he if he got out of his own way he could be a 60 point player but he's just trying way too hard and you can see like he makes that's part of the reason why he's taking so many bad penalties is because he's frustrated because the bounces just aren't going his way and it's one of those circular things that you take bad penalties because you're not scoring and you're not scoring and because you're thinking too much and it just all circles around each other and you just need to knock it off basically yeah i think that to me of if you look at i mean what the coach was saying before the season and what we expect ben is definitely the most disappointing in that group i mean i'm not expecting a lot of production from Stajan or brower but i think bennett versteeg and lazar all of them definitely need to come around and maybe as you said maybe making a few roster moves and sitting lazar and stage if that's what they decide to do for a couple games might help shake things up a little bit and get some guys you know some more minutes or put some fire under some players but i i don't think we can expect a ton of production from the bottom six that's where they're the bottom six but i have no doubt that the bottom six is going to pick it up i think it might take till christmas but like you said you get one or two good bounces you're going to build some confidence and things are going to roll from there yeah, the gear you should expect about twenty to thirty points from anybody in the bottom six, and if they outperform that, hey, awesome. But it it's just tough when most of the guys that are in the bottom six are, have like one or two or three points on the season thus far. And I mean, we're still fairly early. You know, we're not even at the twenty game mark yet, so I can't be too worried about this team yet. I always look at that twenty game mark as where you can start to really evaluate. Yeah, and that's one of those things where, like, if the Flames are struggling, say, at the 40-game mark with the bottom six offense, then you start dispatching players to Stockton, getting Manjapani up here, and looking at acquisitions at the trade deadline for whether that's bringing a guy in like a Ginla as a free agent or trading for whatever veteran ufa guy that's available at the deadline and i think even you know we're gonna be at about the 25 game mark by the end of november i think that's where maybe as you were mentioning if the flames aren't seeing better production maybe you try manjapani or maybe you try hathaway or maybe you try some of these other guys but i don't think it's time for that yet i think we've got to run with the core of what we've got and give them the chance to sort of play themselves out of positions yeah, just like Barkowski did with Kulak. That's an exactly. Um, our friends over at the Biscuit Podcast asked us a question on Twitter today. They said, boys, what's up with Dougie never scoring? They're talking about the fact that last year Dougie Hamilton was a 50-goal scorer, and this year his production hasn't been that good so far. 
I think personally, it's just like the bottom six. We just got to get them going and get them, um, you know, producing some goals from the blue line. We did see four shots on net from him in the New Jersey game, but I don't think that anyone on the blue line's really been producing so far. And I think he's maybe not going to get 50 points again, but I think Dougie's going to pick it up fairly soon here. Well, the main problem with Dougie Hamilton is that he's not on the first power play unit. Because for some reason, the coaching staff likes putting fourth liners on the first power play unit, which is bewildering at best. And that's a large portion of the reason. And Hamilton scores a lot of his goals because he's on the power play. And for whatever reason, they're not doing that. So his not getting the offensive opportunities that he normally would. And... That's mostly on the coaching staff, so him regressing in that regard is the coaching staff's responsibility, and if he was being given the opportunities that he was last year, then, like, yeah, of course he has to shoot more, but if you're not getting any production time with guys like Gaudreau, well, you can't expect to be a 50-point defenseman when you're getting second power play unit time and marginal five on five time you know you and i haven't talked about it a lot on the show but this coaching staff does make some very odd lineup choices and there's a lot of times you're right you scratch your head and you go what are they thinking and i think not only odd choices where they put guys but they're often slow to react when something good happens in the lineup yeah and like them using brower and versteeg on the power play at all is a bad idea and they're on the fourth line because they're not doing very well they should play better in order to earn offensive opportunities. And, like, you can easily, on the two power play units, have the first one be Gaudreau, Monaghan, Yager. The second one be Backlund, Frolik, and Kachuk, or put Bennett where, uh, or Jankowski where Frolik is. Put... Uh, the one power play unit with Giordano and Hamilton, the other with Brody and Stone, there you go. Two easily made power play units, and they'll generate offense. But instead, they have players that are marginal NHL players, period, in prime offensive opportunities, and then they wonder why the power play is struggling. Like, you're just not putting your best talent out there. Well, that's why it's not working. Do you think we might see a change to the defenseman on the power play now that we've got Hamannick out? Do you think that'll cause him to shuffle some things around? I'm hoping so. I'm hoping so. They they need to shake things up because the power play has been extremely ineffective for the entire season. It's, I don't know. Like, like you said, I think it's... quite a bit, but not... Uh, as much as the amount of talent on the roster should dictate. Yeah, and I think we've got a great team. I mean, if you look at the the offensive guys we have here, both offensive defensemen and offensive forwards, like you were saying, you could make up two power play lines easy from what we've got, and that should be, and you said it best, the prime scoring chances. You've got an extra man on the ice. You should be able to score. So when you're sending Brower out there, like you're not you're not taking advantage of that position and it makes you wonder why the coaching staff thinks that's their best option do they see something that we don't yeah well those the guys like Brower, that they're perfectly viable for the penalty kill because you're not expecting them to generate offense you're expecting them to play responsible defensively enough to kill the penalty so that's where they should be getting their ice time is on penalty kill and even a guy like Versteeg could be used on the penalty kill. But it, having them just waste everybody's time offensively, they don't have their abilities from last year even. And like Versteeg is not the same player as he was a year ago, unfortunately. And he's regressed... And whether he picks it up it still remains to be seen, but he's not playing anywhere near the level that he was. And what do you do? You know, you can't... He has to earn 
the ice time, I think. And if he is just being gifted the minutes, well, that's not much of an incentive to actually pick things up. It almost seems that like the coaching staff is still making their staffing decisions based on last year or what they've seen from a guy in the past or what they're seeing in the video room and not what we're seeing on the ice. I don't know if it's denial or what it is, but it's like, oh, these are our veteran guys. They should be out there, you know, on the power play. And yeah, you scratch your head. It's like, we're not going to win our division. We're not going to become a good playoff team if we can't score on the power play, if we're just wasting those chances. Yeah, and especially with the Flames getting so few opportunities, like, they need to make them count. And even if they don't score, have the play in the offensive zone for the majority of the two minutes, so that way you can roll on from there. And it's just perplexing at times with the coaching staff, but we'll see if things change. And a lot of the best power plays I see, even if they're not scoring, like you said, they're in the offensive zone, they're putting pucks on the net, and they're tiring that goalie out. So even after the two minutes when the lines go back to normal, now you've got a goalie who maybe got, you know, three, four, five shots on him in two minutes, and he's tired, and he's, you know, and it's easy to score on him after that if you need to. But I'm hoping things are going to change here. Well, Matt, any other Flames news you want to talk about before we uh, talk a little bit about Stockton? Well, one thing that the Flames need to do overall is generate more offense because I think the Flames are, I think, 25th in the NHL in goals or something ridiculously low like that. And they need, just need to start getting more pucks in the net overall. And I think that some added scoring depth would help that. So what's your suggestion there? Do you think they need to go and make a trade or bring somebody up? And if they need to make no, just uh, somebody I like having a breakthrough and actually scoring a goal, like say Bennett or Jankowski, like actually break through and actually put one in the net, and hopefully get on a roll from there. It's just they need to do something to get more offense, especially in the upcoming games. Yeah, I think Bennett, Jankowski. And Versteeg are probably the guys that are going to have the have the best chance to break out. I think once Yager comes back and he's on those lines, I think we're also going to see somebody's going to have to break out because it's going to be hard to play poorly when Yager's on those lines. Yeah, well, you, if it wasn't for the fact that the Flames had uh, Monaghan and Gaudreau being the best duo in the NHL, with 31 points already like if it wasn't for them the flames wouldn't be eight and six no. right now and so it they need other people to start stepping in and hopefully yager's return will help foster that but we'll have to wait and see we don't have any we don't have anything from the team saying when he'll be back do we it's just that he's still on the ir yeah, well, he's practicing more and more, and like he backskated himself the other day. He's the only guy who like, backskates himself. Yeah, well, he knows what it'll do to him, so yeah, it is what it is. But hopefully, he's getting to the point where he can return. Hopefully, against Vancouver, if not against yeah, Detroit. I can't. I can't see him being out until you know the away game in Detroit. I think he will come back in this homestand somewhere, Vancouver, Detroit, or St. Louis. He's obviously pretty much ready, so yeah, I don't see why. Especially with two waiver moves, you know he's coming back pretty soon. Mm -hmm. Well, Matt, let's take a bit of a trip down to Stockton and talk about the Stockton Heat. There's a lot of good things going on down there. You'd mentioned Andrew Mangiapane earlier. This is a player, I don't know about you, that I wasn't expecting to have a great breakout first season in the AHL. I thought he'd be okay, but he was named the AHL's Player of the Month for October and has recently pushed his point streak to 10 games last night with a goal. He has six goals, 16 points in 10 games. For a 21-year-old kid playing really his first pro season, he's looking pretty good so far. Yeah, well, it's one of those things. Like Jankowski, he was too good for the A, and Manjapani is showing very much the same. And if you're doing more than a point and a half per game in the AHL, you have to get an opportunity in the NHL just for the fact that you're too, obviously doing too good for that level and see if that can translate over to the NHL 
If so, hey, awesome. You have a, another good scoring threat in the lineup. And if not, then, well, you get more information on the player itself. So, and that way you can base further ideas. Like, you know that, okay, this guy's basically like a glorified Kenny Augustino who's too good for the A but not good enough for the NHL or whatever, whatever. But you have to give him the shot in the NHL to see if he'll stick. And it, I think he will once he gets there because he's a very fast player and just a very smart player. And between the two, that'll generate a lot of offense just from that. The player he reminds me the most of is Andrew Cogliano uh, from Edmonton and Anaheim. Just a very smart two-way player who can chip in a little bit of offense, but is just a smart all-around player. So a couple questions for you on Manji Penny. First off, do you think he keeps this pace for the whole season in the AHL, or do you think this is sort of a flash in the pan, you know, he's going to be good and then he'll sort of taper off? I don't expect him to put a point and a half per game in the AHL. Like for the entire season, because like, I think he'll average about ridiculous. a point a game by the time we're all said and done. Yeah, that w that would be about right. Like I don't see him putting up a hundred points in the A, which that's if he continues on the pace, then that's what you're looking at, and he'd either get recalled or uh, cool off one or the other. I don't see that happening, but uh, I. I think he makes his NHL debut sooner than later just because he's doing too well in Stockton and you have to see. But he's this is what the coaching staff and the management has wanted from all these prospects like Poirier, Klimchuk, Shin Carrick. Go down and kick ass and you get a shot. Make us have no choice but, but to recall most, you. Yeah, and Manjapani, Jankowski did the same. Played spectacularly. Okay, you get a shot in the NHL. And then you're playing well up here, you get to stay. Well, Manjapani, he's continuing in Jankowski's absence to put up points, which that was a, a little bit of the concern, was is he just riding Janko's coattails? But obviously he's not. So he should get a shot, and it's... The, on the the rest of the guys like Klimchuk to start showing that they have something there so that then hey you too can get a shot in the NHL if you're actually doing something yeah and I think we've seen from the Flames especially this tendency to go too often with the veteran player you know I think we saw that in the offseason by bringing in guys like Glass and um, putting them right on the NHL roster so I think you're right once a guy earns his spot he's got to be brought up you know I think it was the right move to put Anderson in the AHL to start with but if he can you know earn a spot maybe he takes a spot from Kulak and I think as these guys earn those spots you have to organizationally say all right you're coming up because you are in the spot we can always put you back down later or you know make changes later but if you are in that spot we got to bring that guy up and and see what they've got at the NHL level yeah and like it, it's not like any of like Hamilton Glass Barkowski even Kulak it's not like any of those guys are going to get claimed off waivers by anybody like be realistic you know, every team has th those generic guys. Someone would do us a favor to so, claim some of those guys. True. So it's one of those situations where if you've got these prospects doing well, give them a shot. And if they flounder, oh, well, you at least they learn that this is what the NHL is like and you learn more about that player. So that way you can plan for your off seasons a little bit better because you know what you've got. And guys like Shillington and Anderson, they're both playing well. Riddich and Gillies are both playing well. So it helps have options at least. So that way, with either injuries or just continued spectacular play, that, okay, well, these guys deserve a shot. Let's see what they got. Well, you mentioned David Riddich. Let's talk a little bit about him. David Riddich had a 32 save shutout on Saturday, increasing his Heat all time record for most shutouts by a Heat goalie with seven. He's now had two shutouts and four starts this season. And I think 
we weren't expecting. I mean, David Riddich was really signed to be an AHL backup, but I think he's really giving the Flames a tough decision when it comes to next season. If do you call up Gillies, do you call up Riddich? And I think they're both, as you mentioned earlier, almost too good for the NHL. So it's going to be curious to see what the Flames do. If they, you know, bring one of them up and trade the other, or if they, uh, you're not going to bring them both up. So what do you do with them both next year? And I think that it's great that we have Riddich in such a competitive position and making that. That's what you want to see, guys. You can bring in who you don't expect to do anything, and they really blow your expectations away. Yeah, and we'll see next year. Like, Eddie Lack is not going to be back uh, just because Mike Smith is under contract for next year. So I what I would expect is that one of Gillies and or Riddich – whomever plays well through the off season next year and into training camp next year, whoever wins the job gets to be the backup and go from there. And whomever does not perform goes to the A and splits times with Parsons or McDonald, depending on. And speaking of Mason McDonald, he's actually putting up some fairly decent stats in the ECHL at where Parsons is not so it's one of those things that with all goalies you just have to be patient and wait and see my whole thing looking at the Flames goalie depth is I totally agree with you about Lack and I said this before the season started I think Lack was brought in deliberately to be that one year piece to say okay we're going to give Riddich and Gillies one more year to play in the HL but just looking at the depth we have there and knowing that we've got some goalies that are looking pretty good I think at some point you're going to see one of them move and I think it'll be sooner rather than later maybe even this year at the deadline just because I think that's a position of strength that the Flames can deal from to get some they need so you mean the Flames will finally get that right winger they've always been looking for I don't think that's necessarily it, but I can see us moving. I mean, we're depleted in the draft this year. I can see us moving, say, Riddich for a second-round pick um, and just trying to get some you know, some young assets back. I don't think you can move any one of our goalies yeah. for like a top-line right winger. And we don't have a, a lot of other assets I'd want to move at this point. I don't know about you, Matt. Yeah, it's... Well, the Flames do have a lot of assets. It's just how much does one desire trading <laughs> that's it the assets we yeah. want to get rid of like how wants. great how yeah well it's how great is your need like do you really really need that right winger or is furland okay if furland is okay then you don't need to go and say trade shillington and anderson and say fox or valamaki or you know like the really good prospects for you know to address that need so We'll see. It, it, you know, that's part of why the Flames are just need to be patient and see how the year goes and then see what shakes out, <laughs> you know, because you just never know who's going to come available either and go from yeah, there. Yeah, I also think that part of that question becomes, do you have to trade for that guy during the season or do we think that guy might be available come July 1st for a decent price? True. And... I just want to, you know, because it's very rare that we have three-way trades in the NHL, uh, what did you think of the Duchesne Tourists and four miscellaneous picks and prospects trade? The first thing I thought is, wow, somebody was willing to pay Sackick's price, and it took two teams to pay it, which tells you how expensive it was to get Duchesne. Um, I don't know. I think this is a good deal for two of the teams. I think it's a great deal for Colorado. They get a lot of future assets that I don't even think they're going to keep them all. I think there's pieces that can be moved there. I think Colorado got a, a good goaltender, which I think that they need. I think this is good for Ottawa to get Deshane. Um, I don't know if he's the right guy for that market. I think we've seen a lot of guys like Bobby Ryan go in there that have never played as well as they did before they went in there. I feel like Nashville's a team that gets screwed by only getting Turris. Well, tur they only gave up like two picks and a prospect. For sure, they they paid a fair for... price for Turris. Well, but... you know, like it, yeah. Well, they already have Johansson, and they have have a couple other players. So getting Turris, I feel, cements them as one of the deeper forward groups. And actually makes them basically our main rival in the Western Conference Finals. 
So, yeah, uh, you know, that's... I think it was a good trade for Nashville. And, like, if the Flames get through the Pacific Division, it we're likely going to be playing Nashville in the Western Finals. So, I think it was a good move for them in terms of they didn't give up any roster players and they got a good second-line player. I think Colorado made out like bandits because you have a player that absolutely does not want to be there ever you know and you got uh, a huge haul of first round second round picks and first round second round prospects so you know colorado did well ottawa i think did the worst well, that's it when was the last time you saw a trade where one team got four players and three picks yeah and i think colorado did really well because you got to figure they're gonna suck this year again anyway and i wouldn't be shocked if landis cog gets dealt either for a somewhat similar return and you know just tank it basically because why not you're gonna suck anyway so just blow it out and try to get rasmus dolan or whomever the you know kachuk <laughs> or whomever in the draft and just use all those other assets to get other decent players in the lineup and go from there and just use that cap for whatever whatever in the off season. And I think Ottawa did the worst uh, in the deal because one they traded a center for a winger and like while Turris wasn't going to stay there because his contract demands apparently were excessive at six years at six million per which seems like market value to me but whatever uh duchene's i think that's actually a little below market yeah so like i was a little confused why they'd be offended by that but uh it, you know and he did sign that with nashville um if duchene doesn't stay in ottawa like they gave up a lot of prospects and picks for something that may just like i don't see duchene as being a huge upgrade on Taurus. like he's an upgrade but i don't see it being the difference for what ottawa paid that said if they ottawa can keep duchene for like six years at say seven million per or whatever then i i think that would take a lot of the sting out of the deal but i think ottawa did the worst nashville did the best and colorado did almost as good as nashville i don't think that you make that kind of deal without having talked to no shane's agent no, and of course. I, I would be shocked if if he didn't stay there it would be somewhat amusing if he didn't but Oh, and another thing I have to say is uh, thank you to Peter Torelli for making that rash trade of after the Flames acquired Dougie Hamilton to get Griffin Reinhardt because Matthew Barzal is tearing it up with the New York Islanders and had five assists last night. Yeah, you know, it's not like Edmonton could have used that type of scoring in their lineup, so that's all good. Jordan Eberle had a pair of goals and is leading... I think leading or second on the Islanders in points. So excellent trading, Trelli. Keep it up. While we're talking about trades, there's an interesting story that came out this week from former Flames GM, the one we all forget was GM, Craig Button, who said that he had the opportunity uh, when he first took over the team to make a deal with Mike Milbury in Long Island, moving Romerto Luongo to Calgary um, in exchange for Derek Morris. And at the time, he felt like Derek Morris was really his guy, a top, you know, defenseman, and didn't want to do the deal. Looking back at that, Matt, do you think you might have made a different, uh, different move? I actually, as strange as it sounds, I actually think that Button did the right thing with not getting, making that trade. The Luongo at the time was a high quality prospect, but he had shown nothing at the NHL level. And Morris, even though he was didn't reach his upper end potential, was a top pairing defenseman at the time. And would have been a top pairing defenseman on most teams. So, like, yeah, in hindsight, because Morris regressed, like, 
pretty much suit shortly thereafter especially after he went to Colorado he just kind of faded out of the way but that it would almost be like say trading uh Dougie Hamilton for Matt Murray before Matt Murray won the two cups and it's like yeah you can do that but does that make a lot of sense and, like, of course, Luongo performed well in Florida and became a top-end starter. But, you know, it, it made sense not to make that trade, even though, in hindsight, value-wise, it would have been better. But that said, the Flames did all right by getting Yell and Drury for Morris and McCammond uh, shortly thereafter, and then flipping Drury for Warner. Both uh, Warner and Yell were instrumental in the Flames' cup run. And if we had Luongo, we wouldn't have got Kipper, and I don't think the Flames go anywhere if they didn't have Kipper. So there you go. Yeah, I, I look at it like you do. I think in hindsight, we all look back and say, maybe they should have done this. But at the time, I think it was the right deal. I also wonder at that time if the Flames would have been able to pay Luongo what his demands would have been uh, contract-wise. And I'm not sure they would have, especially in some of that pre-salary cap era. Um, and I think that could have hampered the team too. I think I could see them bringing them in, him holding out and then having to move him for pennies. Yeah. And in which case, you know, the flames probably never make the playoffs. So probably deal a Ginla and were ba would have basically been a laughing stock like Edmonton. That didn't happen. So, you know, now the flames are a contending team again. So yay, everything worked out in the end. Well, let's wrap up by taking a look at the poll from last week. We asked our listeners last week, when Yager returns, who should play right wing on the first line? And we've obviously seen Ferlin still in that right wing position alongside Goudreau and Monaghan. And it was a close poll. I was kind of surprised. 44% uh, of respondents said that Yermer Yager should move on to the first line when he comes back. 33% of people said that Michael Ferlin should stay on the first line. And one person also thought that Sam Bennett should be tried on that first line when Yager comes back. I'm not a one to break up good things. I think right now you leave Ferlin on the first line and you move Yager back to the third line, at least until we see, um, you know, can he play first line minutes or not? Yeah. And Ferlin, I'm still not convinced. I'm still not convinced that Yager is a first line guy this year. I am, but uh, I think that having Ferland on the first line, if Ferland can play well enough where he deserves to be there, then having basically a de facto first line talent in Yager on the second or third line just makes the those lines that much more dangerous. And especially if you put him with Jankowski, then you have two big body players who can use the their intelligence to create havoc. So that you know that could be a very dangerous combination and spread the wealth throughout the lineup quite a bit, especially if they're playing against third pairing defensemen. So we'll see. Can't hurt. I would like to see. I would like to see a third line when Yager comes back of Bennett on the left, Jankowski in the middle, and Yager on the right. Same here. I think that would be good for the two young guys. I think that's where we need to use Yager this year is to be that veteran mentor for some young guys. And I think you could really, if that line can get going, you could have a lot of talent on that Yeah, line. well, you got to figure that Jankowski is a very smart player, and that's been pretty much the hallmark of why he's been a good prospect for the flames is that he's just he thinks the game very well and his skill level at times has been a little questionable but the the mind works and similar with yager yeah he's not as fast as he is used to be but his mind is still there so having two extremely smart players working together that could be a very dangerous line yeah, and I think that we've said, you know, in the past that Bennett's not thinking right, and I think Yager would hold him accountable for some of his dumb play, and I think that in that line, Yager can be the guy who does the thinking, and a guy like 
Bennett just needs to play the game and get open and yeah, you'll get you the be puck here, from, put your stick on the ice. I hit it. You put the puck in the net. Pretty much. And if you can't jank, I'll yeah, do it. Exactly. And I think that Yager is also the place in his career where unlike some other guys in the bottom six, he might be willing to make that one extra pass to make sure one of the younger guys gets the point or gets the goal. Possibly. Um, I mean, he's got none left to prove at this point. And so, Matt, that brings us to this this week's poll. And as always, people can vote on this by going to our website, firesidechat.ca. They can vote for it on our Twitter. You'll see it uh, near the top of our feed, and we'll tweet it a couple times during the week. And our Twitter is twitter.com slash firesidepodcast. Or you can see it on our Facebook page. We'll have it pinned at the top for the week, and that's facebook.com slash firesidechat. We talked this week about the bottom six and some of the scoring woes that we've had. So our poll this week is which bottom six four do you think will get the most points this season? We're putting in all the usual suspects for Stieg, Bennett, Lazar, Stajan, Brower, Hamilton, and Jankowski. We've taken Yager and Furland out of the list because those guys, I think, are going to float between the first line all season. And I'm going to go and with it's... Sam Bennett. I think I still believe in Sam Bennett. So, yeah. Him or Jankowski will be the winners of that. I think once Bennett comes alive, he's going to do some damage. But the question is, when does he come alive? Is that November? Is that March? Yeah, we'll see. I think once he just gets Um, a stupid garbage goal, you know what I mean, where something just bounces in as a fluke and he gets credit for it, then like he'll probably go on a 10-game, 10-goal streak or something like that. I'm hoping, just because of what we paid for him, I'm really hoping that we actually get a lot of production this year from Lazar. We gave up a second-round pick for him. We really need Lazar to to come out strong and to you know get get a good, I think, a good point tally set up this yeah. year. Yeah, as long as he is an effective third, fourth line guy, like even if he doesn't put up a ton of points, that's fine. The draft last year really sucked, so I'm not really concerned about it being a second round pick it was more like a third or a fourth if you're talking a normal draft so and likely if we would have had that pick anyway we probably would have taken Ruzitska anyway so what's the difference yeah I guess just on paper you look at it and go we gave up a second oh I know in a normal draft year I don't think the Flames give up anything more than like a third or a fourth for Lazar but that draft was terrible so (laughs) well now with that we've got uh, our look ahead for the week the flames continue their home stand that they've been on they've got three home games this week they'll play the vancouver canucks on tuesday the 7th thursday the 9th the detroit red wings roll into town then they get the whole weekend off they get a long weekend the 10th 11th 12th off and they'll come back on the 13th on monday to play the st louis blues to end off their seven game home stand Six points on the table. What are you thinking we do here? Well, I'm going to go with four points. I think that they'll beat Vancouver and St. Louis and lose to Detroit. Interesting. Yeah. Vancouver's been hot lately. Yeah, the paper tiger. I think that people are were underestimating Brock Besser, and I don't see... Um, the fourth line guy, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, who's scoring all those goals. Uh, Dorset, there you go. Uh, I don't expect him to continue his offensive streak. So once he cools off, I think that so go the Canucks. And last time we played St. Louis, they beat us 5-2. to two. I know. Well, I think uh, the Flames, uh, they have always struggled in the Scott Trade Center, but they don't do too badly against them in the Saddle Dome. So we'll see. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go four points as well. I think we beat Vancouver, we beat Detroit, and I think that St. Louis is gonna be the hard game of the week. I don't think they'll necessarily. I'm not saying they're gonna lose, but I think of the three of them, St. Louis is gonna pose the biggest challenge. But I'm looking forward to seeing hopefully Rasmus Anderson in all three of these. Bartkowski's pl- now watch. We'll lose against Vancouver and beat both Detroit and St. Louis. You know what? As long as they get four points, I'm happy. 
I don't care how they come, but I'm just hoping we see Anderson in all three games. If Bartkowski's in the lineup and Anderson's not, I'm really going to be scratching my head wondering what kind of man management's going on here. All right, Matt, anything else you want to chat about? Yeah, uh, you, especially with that last game, giving up that penalty shot. You know, that, penal- that penalty shot was just terrible. So, you know, you have to figure that Anderson's got to go in there. Yeah, for sure. You can't you can't put Bart back out there. I think if anything, Bart's got to sit in the press box for a little bit. Someone's gonna have to take Tanner Glass's seat and keep it warm. And you know, you don't bring Raz up to sit on the bench. That doesn't make any sense. No. All right. Well, with that, I think we're done for the week. Matt, you have a great week and enjoy the rest of the Flames homestand. And we'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good one. Bye. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.